Hello and welcome to Mean Brews. My name is Matthew Harold, and this is our first episode where we're going to dive into a style and uh, figure out all the details of how to come up with a winning recipe. Uh, the style we're going to start with is a Hefeweizen. Uh, Hefeweizen is probably one of the more simple recipes to brew. Uh, I've chosen it first so uh, it's easier to follow along with how we've, we're showing the data. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, our objective, again, is to present um, over 14 years of accumulated um, winning recipes um, that we've gathered from the web, um, as well as give you some interpretation of the data so that you can formulate your own recipe. Uh, this is an advanced course. Um, we're not going to dive into the style. We assume you already know what Hefeweizen is. We'll just get right into the data. Uh, we're first going to go over the sources of where I obtained the data from, some high-level attributes of the style, an overview of their ingredients, their prominence and proportions, some mash statistics, um, some boil durations, fermentation temperatures, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna share some uh, some of the guidance from some of our uh, home brewing experts um, and what they say about the style and how to make the best style you can. So where did I get my data from? Um, we had a total of twenty winning Hefeweizen recipes, 50% um, of them were from NHC, uh, recipes shared from the National Homebrewing Competition. Uh, so a good share of really great recipes and great winners to have won at that high of a level. Um, looking at the right, um, we had 12 gold medalist uh, recipes. One was gold and best of show. Uh, three silver medal recipes. Uh, two bronze and two that just claim to be award-winning. Um, the forty, well, uh, it's, it's it's funny. Forty percent of the websites uh, recipes that are make up this list, the websites no longer exist. We've been doing this so long that the websites have gone out of out of. Uh, you know, you have to go to the Internet Archive to get the data. However, the data that we captured when we originally captured the data set is still in our repository. So we can still um, analyze that. Style overview. Um, it's a subset of BJCP10A, which is Weizen. Weizen. Uh, Hefe means yeast, and Weizen means wheat. Uh, the yeast is what makes it cloudy. Um, the style requires, in Germany, I think a minimum of 50% wheat malt. Uh, the BJCP description is a pale, refreshing German wheat beer with high carbonation, dry finish, a fluffy mouthfeel, and a distinctive ban banana and clove yeast character. As far as the uh, style stability from the recipes that we've looked at, the earliest recipe I think we had was from 2000. Um, it hasn't really changed. So over time, uh, the recipe has not evolved. Um, and, then, and then for style variation, what's the, what's the delta between recipes that we've seen regardless of time? There's been very, very little variation between the winning recipes. And we'll get deeper into that as we go on. Uh, original gravity. So uh, if you took the tutorial, you know uh, what I'm plotting here, but I'll walk through it again. So the, the average original gravity for a Hefeweizen was 1.052. A winning Hefeweizen was 1.052. And that is right up on the upper end limit of the BJCP style. Um, so 50% of the recipes were greater than that. And you can even see the biggest outlier at a 1.070 original gravity amazing um, the smallest og was also outside the bjcp range at 1.042 um, I, I took this data and I, I threw out the high and low which you do sometimes with statistics um, it did not affect the mean uh, significantly um, but it did significantly affect the variance so um, you know i would try to stay within you know if you're going to use this 1.045 to 1.057 somewhere in that realm that's about one standard deviation away from the from the mean and that will make probably um, highest chance of you winning with your recipe if you stay within that range IBUs um, so the IBUs kind of followed the original gravity with uh, probably not 50% but a big portion of them at the high or above the highest BJCP range the highest was right there at 23 IBUs. Uh, and the smallest was right around eight. Um, so again, air on the side of the high. 
uh, high range or high on the uh, range of IBUs per BJCP and you should do fine. Uh, the color, the SRM variants, um, pretty much all the samples stayed within the BJCP range. So, um, you know, and the mean is right on the, the center of the range as well. So uh, no real surprises here. Uh, the average recipe malt type percentages. So if you looked at, um, you know, your base malts, your specialty malts, and your adjuncts, 98% uh, of, when you average all the 20 recipes, they average 98% base malt, 1% specialty malt, and 0.3% adjunct. So such a small portion of specialty and adjunct malts. Um, it really doesn't make sense to even use them. Um, you know, when all recipe proportions are average, 99% of the grist is Pilsner and wheat, you should stick with that. So the proportion of the base malt ingredients, this is the, um, the only two base malts that were used, well, there were some that used Munich, but the two prominent ones that we recommend using uh, are, again, Pilsner malt, a German Pilsner is preferred, and a German wheat malt. And the averages of the two um, with all the recipes were 58% um, of the grist should be wheat malt and 40% of the grist should be Pilsner malt. And these kind of varied. You can see the highs and lows there. The high for the wheat malt is, you know, all, what's almost 72, 73% wheat, low at 49%. Um, and then the, the Pilsner malt never went above 50%. Um, but did go down to as much as 21% uh, Pilsner malt. Um, you know, it's kind of surprising that only 5%, I think one recipe had a straight 50-50 split of Pilsner and, and wheat malts. That was surprising to me. Um, the variance on the wheat malt was, you can see it's a, sh it's a sharper curve than the Pilsner. So that kind of tells me when they, when they did put specialty malts in there, they weren't substituting the wheat, they were substituting the Pilsner malts. Speaking of, uh, you know, the additional malts that were used, five of the 20 uh, recipes used some additional grains. Um, and, you know, I, I can't recommend, based upon this, to change from using just base malts. Um, three of them used, you, you can see there, flaked wheat, carahel, or carapils. And these are like body, what I consider body modifiers. They're to give you more mouthfeel, give you that fluffy mouthfeel. Um, Again, if you do your mash correctly, you shouldn't have to do this. Uh, there were some flavor modifiers. You know, they did use uh, one recipe used Vienna. Two, one recipe used Munich at 7% of the grist. Two recipes used melanoidin, you know, to try to replicate that decoction. And we can talk about that a little bit once we get into, you know, the, the types of mashes that were used for uh, Hefeweizen. Again, I wouldn't. Based upon this, um, I wouldn't use any of these um, specialty malts for my recipe. Hop additions. Um, of course, 100% of the recipes use bittering hops. Um, and 30% of them used a flavor hop. or uh, What we call flavor hops are anything between 10 and 20 minute additions. 10% uh, used aroma hop additions. And, and of course... For the style, no recipes use Whirlpool or dry hops, and you'd expect that for this style. Um, based upon this prevalence, again, I would not recommend using any flavor aroma hop addition. The straight bittering addition is all you really need for this style. So what bittering hops were used? Um, the majority of the recipes used Haller Tower, Haller Tower Middle Fruit. Only one recipe used a non-European continental um, hop, which is the uh, Liberty. Um, the rest were all German hops. We recommend using German hops. Uh, the Magnum are pretty new. The later recipes in the in the uh, suite that we have used a couple of them used Magnum, uh, but again, Hallertauer Middle Free was pretty much the majority uh, hop used here. Flavor hops. We don't recommend using flavor hops, but they were all spread out for these uh, four recipes, five recipes, um, between Haller, Herzbrucker, Liberty, and Tet. So it doesn't really, there's really no um, guidance on which way you should go if you decide to use flavor hops. 
Aroma hops, only two recipes used aroma hops. I don't recommend using aroma hops, uh, but it was Sots and, and Heller middle fruit. Uh, for the yeast, um, there were four yeast used. Um, it's gone back and forth through the years between the two Vian Stefaner uh, Hefe yeast strains um, with White Labs 300 or Y yeast 3068 being the, the clear... Uh, um, not clear, but being the more prevalent than the 380. Um, there have been some notable recipes, and I'll get into that later, that have used 380. Um, personally, I've used 380 successfully and won medals with, uh, by using that yeast. I think you can interchange either of those two. I, th I don't think there's really a preference to go one way or the other. Um, other ones were, I think, uh, y, y, yeast, y yeast 3056 and 3650. Uh, one of them may be a blend, I think, and another one is another Bavarian Weizen um, yeast that Y yeast puts out. But they were not very prominent. Uh, mash types. So when you look at the, the types of mashes that can be used, it was split. You know, there was, uh, there's definitely a case to say step mashing is important. You know, probably 75%, which is the decoction and the step mash, um, both followed a staggered uh, mash temp profile, and we'll get into that in a little bit more detail later. Um, but there was a portion that did single infusion mashes. Um, so I think you could get, a, I mean, obviously people are winning with all three, um, but there does seem to be a prevalence for, you know, using some sort of um, staggered temperature mash uh, for hefeweizen. So here's the... Uh, Here's the rests, and if you went to my introduction, you know how this chart works, so I won't repeat it. Um, you know, everybody did a alpha amylase rest right at around 152, right here. Um, surprisingly, a small portion, 30%, did the beta rest. Um, a protein rest, 50% of the recipes did a protein rest right at about 123, 124. Um, and ferulic acid rest, 30%. I think they're trying to get the ferulic acid in both of these rests. Ferulic acid is important for the style. Um, and then, you know, beta-glucanase, try to th uh, thin out the mash. 10% of the recipes did that. So from this data, I think I'd pick either one or both of these acid rests because they're critical for the style. And then a single, you know, sacrification rest somewhere in, in the low 150s. The duration of the boil, 40% uh, of the recipes told us how long they boiled the wort. Uh, the average boil time was 83 minutes, with 60 as the low and 110 as the high. Um, nearly all the decocted beers did not report their boil time, so I think they probably thought it was unimportant because they boiled it enough. Um, I think you might be seeing some of the other recipes go for a longer boil to kind of try to develop color. Um, so the, the 110 one was a single infusion mash. So definitely they're, they're, they're using different mechanisms to try to get the color in the, in the beer. <clears throat> so I recommend if you're going to use an infusion mash that you go with a, a longer boil. But if you're going to decoct it, um, I think you can go with your, your typical uh, 60 to, to 80 minute um, boil here and be fine. Fermentation temperature, 70% of the recipes reported fermentation temperatures. All but one of the recipe was in the in the 60s. We had one at 70. Um, there was little variation for the types of strains used. Um, you know, it didn't matter if you were using one. There were no groupings based upon yeast type. Um, I think it's recommended to, from this data, you, you would say, um, there's a recommendation to do a... Uh, primary fermentation at 65 and then let it uh, let it ramp up as it's fermenting uh, but there are some notable recipes um, and notable data from you know Jamil's book that say you should start at 62 uh, one of the recipes in my data set is Nick Corona's um, Hefeweizen recipe and I've kept a keen eye on that one because uh, he won NHC best to show with his Hefeweizen he starts at 62 goes to 65 then 68 and not only did he win Best of Show at NHC, he also won Best of Show the same year with the same beer 
at Master Championship of Amateur Brewers, and that's both of, winning both of those is huge. That must have been a damn fine beer. So, um, you know, definitely would um, consider that. And I think when I, we give our suggested recipe at the end, we use that that uh, fermentation profile um, just because of the two sources that have recommended it are very you know credible sources. Um, pitch rate. This is a this is the yeast pitch rate for the style. To get those esters, you've got to basically under pitch. Uh, recommendation is 500,000 cells per milliliter per degree Play-Doh. This is this is less than they recommend for ales. Um, you got to make sure your yeast is viable and healthy. So a vitality starter might be warranted. Um, for example, you know this is something you could probably. If you pitch the 1.052 wort into five gallons, you could get away with using a single fresh pack of, of White Labs yeast. It's got a right, right, right about 120 billion cells, and you need 123. So this is this is what makes Hefeweizen an easier style to brew. You may not need a yeast starter if you've got a fresh pack of yeast. Uh, y yeast has 100 billion cells, so you might want to do a, a, a quick vitality starter there with, with a smack pack of Y yeast. Water profile, it's very apparent that chlorides are very important for a good Hefeweizen. For the recipes, added calcium chloride at an average rate of about 1.3 grams per gallon. I assume they did this, they didn't report the waters, but I assume they did this to try to replicate the Munich boiled profile, which has, you can see here, the 75 parts per million of chlorides. Um, this, this scatter was pretty big. Uh, however, most of the most of the newer recipes use chlorides versus the older's, which didn't report it. Um, if you look at uh, the water book by Palmer and Kaminsky, they recommend something 50 to 100 parts per million calcium, 0 to 50 uh, sulfate, uh, 50 to 100 chloride, and um, 0 to 80 bicarbonate. Um, kind of lines up with what you see above um, in the Munich boiled. So I think this is the water that that you should probably try to try to hit based upon uh, you know the data that we've seen. An important one I think is is to is that ferulic acid rest. Um, you kind of want to do that at a high pH. Um, you want to do you want to do that rest um, before you add your salts. So the salts will bring the the pH down, and before you add your acids even, um, and the more you know, the ferulic acid is soluble so much in, in water, it becomes saturated. And the more basic you are, the more alkaline you are when you start your ferulic acid rest, the more ferulic acid you will develop. Or the ferulic, yeah, the more ferulic acid you will get uh, dissolved into your, your, your wort. So I think it's, it's important to start out with a high pH in the 5.7, 5.8 range. <clears throat> um, you'll see later Kuntz. I hope I'm saying that right. Kunz, the Kunzi book um, recommends that as well um, to kind of draw out that ferulic acid and make sure you get that clove. Ferulic acid brings out the clove, of course, in uh, in the beer. And if you don't have enough, then the yeast won't have enough to turn into that flavor. Carbonation. A lot of people have different volumes of carbonation. How to Brew says one thing. Eric Warner's German... Uh, German Weizen book says says another. When you average all these, it's it's really the average is right at 3.5 volumes, which is much higher than <clears throat> excuse me your your typical ales um, that that you brew. Um, so hard to bottle um, with a beer gun. Uh, you might shoot it. You, you know you might try to bottle condition uh, to get that that kind of uh, carbonation and use the uh, you know the high carbonation bottles so you don't get bottle bombs. So Kunzi from Technology Multi and Brewing. I read through this. Um, some 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 parts that I took away for the style. The aroma is influenced by the formation of four vinyl guajacol. I'm saying that wrong, but um, so how do you get this compound? Um, basically, it recommends mashing in at low temperatures. Again, mash at a pH of 5.7 to 5.8. Um, it's important to use at least 40% barley malt. Um, so that has a factor in, in, uh, in that as well. The strain of yeast is important. 
Um, this is where it kind of deviates from what we're seeing in the data. It says ferment, ferment at 68 to 75. Um, again, our, our mean was 65, and, and Jamil and uh, Nick Corona's recipe started at 68 or 62. So, you know, this is important. Um, it said use the use one or two yeast cycles, and that's it. So I guess he's, they're not recommending, you know, repitching yeast over and over. Um, and if you are going to harvest yeast, it recommends harvesting early. Um, Kutsi also said that, um, you know, if you leave your beer on the yeast a long time at a higher temperature, you're going to have a huge uh, deterioration in the flavor. Uh, so I took that as meaning once the primary is over, um, you know, rack it off the yeast as, as soon as possible and get into a keg or bottle it. Um, use a mash ratio of 1.3 to 1.4 quarts per pound. Um, remove the yeast after primary fermentation is complete, usually three to four days. This is what they say. Uh, and, and most of the um, commercial Weizens, they bottle condition with lager yeast. I thought that was unique. So, from Brewing Classic Styles, um, Jamil and, and Palmer's recommendation was to use, John Palmer's recommendation, to use the best malt you can find because that's primary flavor in the beer. Is malt, it's not hops. Um, fermentation with a strong oxygenation. It says start at 62. So Jamil's had success at 62. Um, and then he recommended a 50-50 split of wheat and Pilsner. Uh, designing great beers. Uh, the malt bill, OG and IBU and bittering, hop values and fermentation temperature, all that data aligned almost identically with what um, I presented here. Uh, the mash temperatures differed. Uh, he recommended a single infusion mash at 152. Um, flavor and hop aroma, aroma hop additions were included in 40% of the recipes in his book. Significant difference to what we presented. Um, you know, my data is probably a little bit newer. Uh, I don't know if he's updated that book recently, but a lot of the recent uh, beers do not put in flavor aroma hops into a Hefeweizen. So Gordon Strong's Brewing Better Beer recommends doing a single decoction for color. Uh, step mash is recommended for with an acid rest of 111, protein rest at 131, sacrification rest of 158. That's a lot higher than what we had. A 90-minute boil was recommended. Um, he did follow the 60-40 that we're recommending here. Um, and he recommends uh, YEAST 3068, which aligns to the data that we're using, and also a single bittering addition of sterling hops. Um, you know, this is, uh, aligns well with the data that we're presenting. Again, F of is pretty, pretty uh, low variation, so you're not gonna see a big difference. We will have some styles that have some crazy, crazy data. Uh, Eric Warner from German Wheat Beer. Uh, original Gravity and IBUs are right on point with what we presented. He said, and this was interesting, that some of the Weizens started out with high carbonates in their water, um, as much as 450 parts per million. That kind of lends to the argument I was saying about the ferulic acid extraction. Uh, the more carbonates you have, the more alkaline the, the strike water, the more ferulic acid you're going to extract from the beer or from the, from the grains. Um, he says a single decoction is required. I know it's debatable. Um he says he doesn't know any any breweries in Germany that use this single step infusion mash. Uh, his sacrification mash temperatures are 158, align with uh, Gordon Strong's. Probably to try to get that mouth feel um, because the hop plays second fiddle. Uh, their the use of hops varieties are not cru crucial. Probably would agree with him. Um, due to the amount of wheat, a longer boil. Here's the reason why he's saying a longer boil. They use a longer boil for Hefeweizens to ensure protein coagulation. So that might be why you're seeing the 80 minute versus the standard 60, all the way up to 110 in the data. Okay, so if we took all this data, how would you, how would I determine a recipe? Uh, and so here's here's my uh, here's my take on what I would do here. Um, basically, I would have um, wheat malt and Pilsner malt. At the ratio of 60-40, you're seeing it 57-38 because I usually add rice holes to my mash when I'm doing a heavily weeded um, grist. Bill, grist. Um, Hallertauer middle fruit right at 13.6. IBUs right at the mean. And I'm going to use White Labs 300 
uh, it's the most prominent. I'm going to use filtered RO 50-50 um, to try to get my bar carbonates up. Try to match the, the Munich boiled profile, uh, which is pasted here. I'm going to step mash per this profile. I'm going to start out with uh, you know, 15 minute rest at 114. Ramp up to 124 for another 15 minutes. Then I'm going to add my salts which is just going to be some calcium chloride to try to reach this profile. And I'm going to do a 60 minute um, sacrification rest at 158 and then a mash out at 168. I would sparge as usual, boil a wart for 80 minutes. That was right on the average. Chill to 62, oxygenate and pitch at the rate we talked about before. Uh, ferment for three days at 62, ramp to 65 for three days, and then 68 for five more days, then get it off the yeast. Carbonate to 3.5 volumes. So that's the end of my uh, Hefeweizen uh, tutorial presentation. Um, please do um, send us some feedback on any improvements you have, you think we should add to this, any more information we could have, what, what you didn't find valuable at memebrews at gmail.com. If you've got any winning recipes for any styles and you'd like to share it with us, please email it to me. Um, we will definitely include that data into our data set and present in future episodes. Um, one thing we're going to do at the end of these is I've created a little uh, beer randomizer that has all the styles that we're going to cover. I don't even know what style we're going to cover next, but when I press this button, it's going to pop in. So you're going to find out as, as soon as I am. So I'll press this button. And the next beer, hey, American Wheat or Rye beer. So category 1D is going to be the next uh, style that we cover. Another wheat beer. So uh, thanks again for tuning in. Please subscribe. You know, hit that little notification bar. We're going to try to do one a week. And I, I look forward to seeing you next week.